So yeah, I'm Harrison. I'm an applications engineer from Dynastream Innovations. We, as part of our products, we also make Ant Plus. And many people might be wondering what Ant Plus is. Uh, I'll be getting to that in one slide or so. But first of all, I would like to thank, is, is there anyone who, in the hackathon in the crowd today? Who was there on Sunday? One? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So, we thank all of you guys for coming out. We thank our winners for bringing out things like dating with Ant Plus, meeting with Ant Plus, playing swarm games with Ant Plus. These are all really cool ideas. And we'd also really like to thank Sony, our sponsors, for bringing us all the development phones for anyone there to be able to use Ant Plus natively on a handheld for their development. So. Now I'd like to talk about, so what is Ant Plus, or Ant? So Ant is a 2.4 gigahertz ultra low power protocol. It resides on phones natively along with Bluetooth, along with Wi-Fi, along with other protocols on that spectrum. Uh, we have shipped so far at least 60, over 60 million Ant Plus nodes worldwide, including phones, sensors, devices. We also, with Ant Plus can communicate for years on end on a single coin cell battery and that's on any end of the link depending on your power consumption requirements. Um, a big feature of Ant is its flexibility. So here I'm just saying hundreds of transmitters coexist on the same RF channel. So what can we do with that? I'll be going on later on what that enables us to do. Also, with these channels, they're all fully separate and logical from each other on the device. So if you use a, a single channel as a master, as a slave, as a broadcast, as an acknowledged, all of this is independent, so you can do anything with each of a logical channel on, say, a phone or even an embedded device. So with this, uh, we have HTC makes the rhyme, and then Sony has many Xperia phones that include Ant Plus. This all goes behind a common API. So if you write an application that uses a Sony phone, that uses an HTC phone, or even uses the USB stick through USB host, all of this does not have to be rewritten. It's all behind one API. This is just a little bit of a technical detail. Um, standard Ant packets are about 8 bytes. It was designed for sensor data along with up to 24 byte burst packets, which is for up to 60 kilobit per second communication for the times that you need it. So I'll be going on a little bit more about how Ant Plus works and what it can do, but, sorry, Ant can do, but Ant Plus is our set of device profiles, which as it says on the slide, mutually agreed upon set of standards. So we work with our over 350 member companies, including the, some of the names up here, or all of the names up here, who work with us to bring device profiles to the market so that everyone <coughs> who uses Ant Plus can be compatible with each other. So what can you do with Ant Plus? So typically you can do single point-to-point -point communication. So in this case, you can do a heart rate to a watch. That same channel though, which is open broadcasting, can be received by, in this case, one to many, and that means any number of slave channels can receive from a single channel. So you could have any number of devices listening at the same time. In this case, fitness equipment, a watch, a cell phone, anything like that. And then of course you can arrange, so because each channel is individual, each channel can, there's many channels on a single device, right now it's eight, that can be expanded into the future. They, you can deploy any, a star topology, and then you could be a transmitter or a receiver in this case. A watch. And then also, because of the nature of Ant, we can also do shared topologies. In this case, this is a tree. So one single master channel can transmit, slaves can listen to that transmission, and then the slaves can bi-directionally be addressed by that master to communicate back. So in this case, you could do the one-to-many, and then you can address each slave as you need to for them to talk back on a single channel. And then, of course, we have a couple modes. We have asynchronous modes. That includes background scanning, 
and continuous scanning, which allows us to receive messages from many, many different masters transmitting simultaneously. And then we can also retransmit as well the same data, different data, whatever is written in the application level. You're welcome. So <clears throat> this is enabled by the fact that Ant can transmit many, many masters on the same RF channel. This means that you can receive on one single frequency because it's difficult for a single radio to receive from multiple frequencies. To so we are able to create these asynchronous topologies. And so on, you could receive from 50 FE bikes and then you can have a bit of a chat with each other at the same time. So of course you could do one heart strap to many devices. Your FE equipment receives data from your watch and how to set up itself. Then you could pass that data back from either received directly from a heart rate from a phone or you can even configure the watch from your phone. So we'll do a little bit of, this is really low level, but just to demonstrate how Ant does this, it's, it's a TDMA style scheme. So Ant tr masters transmit at a periodic rate. So of course there's going to be clock drift, there's going to be setting differences. So as the ch masters begin to transmit close to each other, the masters will automatically shift out of the way. This is how you're able to expose many, many devices on the same RF channel. And this is also how bi-directional communication works. So as you open a period, you're able to resend that transmission immediately <clears throat> that the other masters or slaves can listen to. So I was talking about how we do asynchronous topology. So on a phone, we enable something called a, a background scan. So the background scan, we use a somewhat discontinuous waveform. We enable other channels to operate on that device at the same time, but we can now receive data from all of those masters, generally not consistently, but at the same time. This allows you to do very interesting topologies, this allows you to do monitoring, this allows you to do RSSI scanning. So for instance, you wanted to show your user a list of all the devices in the area. So that, that's what this allows you to do. And of course, this is actually only for embedded devices, but for instance, if you had a number of phones or a number of sensors walk into a room and then you wanted to immediately receive all of that information at the same time. So you could deploy an, a single chip, such as a USB stick, that does a continuous scan. A continuous scan is guaranteed to receive every RF message that doesn't, that it's able to over the air and it's fully bi-directional. You're able to communicate back to any of these transmitters at the same time you receive from them. And in this case, you can choose to when you transmit back. So in this case, it's potentially up to hundreds of transmitters. The over-the-air limit is 300 hertz. So about 150 devices going back and forth at, at one hertz, for instance. <clears throat> so... We, that is a little bit about what Ant is capable of. So on top of Ant, we build device profiles. Device profiles are our open <laughs> definition for device compatibility. So in this case, we give the configuration settings. We give you the message formats. We've defined file transfer mechanisms. We've defined a standardized file, compressed file format for embedded and low power and small memory devices. And in this case, we have a sampling of profiles, there's blood pressure, there's continuous glucose, there's weight scale, and this is another, this isn't all of the profiles, but this is another set of profiles we offer, mainly the sport and fitness market, which is where Ant is the most popular and is the dominant protocol in. But we also offer temperature data, stride-based data, uh, we also have control demos if you come by our, our booth to see those, uh, pressure sensor array for diabetics. So if in case their feet are, have rocks in their shoes, if they're standing in one spot too long, they can't feel that anymore. So we have companies that are working on those kinds of sensors as well. So again, I was showing with the Sony Xperia phone, and in this case, a Garmin watch that controls profile. It's fully bi-directional. 
many, many controls can connect to that same transmitting channel from the phone. We've also saw a lot of uh, use at the hackathon of our geocache devices. So these devices are meant for geocaching games. I'm not sure how many of you have actually attended or done one of those themselves. Kind of reminds me of Ingress <laughs> just a touch. But sure. in this case, there's no connection to the internet or cloud. All data storage occurs at that point to the chirp. So as the phone or as the GPS unit passes by a chirp, you write the, you update the hint location, the data, the visitor count, where the next place to go might be. That's what geocaches enable, and those are readily available on the market. Again, we are very big in sports and fitness, and particularly cycling. We are the dominant protocol there, so we give a lot of data on transmitting power data, for instance. So we have a lot of Olympic athletes that train to exacting specifications with our data. And we have many partners like Cyclops that are stages that create devices and power meters for these. Another profile we have is uh, activity monitors. So I said with a continuous scan, you can immediately see messages that are transmitting. So in an activity monitor, we have people that are going out during the day, they are running, they are walking, and you want to know how much you're actually doing in a day. So you keep a small little sensor. In this case, I actually have one of these. It's this big. It fits in your uh, change pocket. Um, it runs for about at least a year on a coin cell battery. And as you pass by the access point, it finds that beacon, and it automatically uses Antifest, which is a file transfer uh, protocol, to download from these devices as you pass by it, that scanning access point. So that could happen at a doorway. We actually have a Wi-Fi ant bridge which does this. And then of course we have continuous glucose monitors. So uh, Dexcom w is working on a CGM, a continuous glucose, which automatically measures your glucose level for diabetics every about, and transmits every about five minutes. This is fully authenticated. There is security built into the device profile to prevent other people from downloading or interfering with that data. That is done at the application level so far. And of course, all of these profiles can be compatible with a phone, with an embedded device, with a display. Uh, the protocol is very, very lightweight. This can be stored in many, many devices. So I'm going to jump right in then from device profiles to how do we integrate Ant with Android. So in this case, we work with chip vendors to integrate the Ant firmware with their code. So it exists alongside Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and on chips such as from Qualcomm, from ST Ericsson, from uh, Broadcom. So <coughs> we write that. We also help them write the hardware abstraction layer. Um, and we also have our own hardware app, a HAL service on top of that, which is open source and actually publicly available on GitHub. And then we also have two pieces. We write the ANT radio service and the ANT USB service. So as I come back here, so for the ANT USB service, <coughs> the nice part about our setup is that once you've downloaded our radio service, which is effectively like an API library layer, you can actually write apps to just that API. And then this remains common across all devices. So we've, we're doing a lot of work to try and minimize fragmentation with Ant as we appear on more and more mobile devices. So if you write an application with Ant for the HTC, for Samsung, for USB sticks, all of these applications will work. So this is just showing how it works. It's USB host is also something we pass through if your phone hopefully supports it. And then of course we also offer plugins. So plugins are our abstraction of the device profile. So we want to take away the work that developers do from writing byte manipulation from determining status bits. We want to remove all that. We just want to give raw event data 
from these sensors to applications. So we offer that. We also want to be able to share this information. So for instance, Dexcom needs a continuous connection to their CGM device. And other, all these applications need to run at the same time in the background, but what if other applications also want that sensor data? So our plugins go through the, uh, a full layer of Google IPC to make sure that the as asynchronous uh, connection between applications. So you can, if you or other applications want to also pull from the same sensor, you're all free to do so. Also, another nice part about this architecture then with the abstraction from the ant radio service is that you can actually add, it's a bit of a niche case, you can add multiple USB sticks to your Android device and you can start pooling channels. If you needed 16 channels, you can take a native device and you can plug in another USB stick and you'd have 16 channels to work with. So we call this the plugin communicator classes. So there's a heart rate PCC, there's a remote control PCC. Uh, we are adding more and we are continuing to build on the plugin profiles we, over the next kind of several months. So we'll be adding more and more profiles. They pass through the generic ant channel API. So we actually provide a channel provider which manages the distribution of channels to applications. <clears throat> so that multiple applications can share from the same uh, ant device. So this is where it's going to get a little dry. So our PCC, it's a relatively simple class. All you need to do to pull data from a sensor, request access, and subscribe to event. And that's all you really need from a PCC. If you would like to know the device ID, if you'd like to know the name of that device, we let you access that data as well. But that's really, you only need two of these functions to access any of that data. So this is what a request access looks like. It's fairly standard. You pass in your activity, which is your front end UI. We use that for threading. You want to pass in your context, which is typically your service that's running in the background. Again, for lifecycle management. We call it skip preferred search. So we allow users to save which devices they frequently connect to. They have their own specific heart rate strap. They and their wife maybe share the same bike computer. So you can actually say, okay, I would like to say this is my device, or maybe this is not my device all the time. So you can set that. And then you only need to pass in the receiver methods and the device state change methods. <clears throat> So then, of course, this is the default UI we give with that connection access. So we will show you the device IDs. We would like to add more information to this screen as well, such as proximity data, the RSSI indicator. And then we, you can come here and you can save the uh, friendly name for that device as well as the whether it's the preferred device. So then if you try to connect, if it finds it and connects to it, you won't, the user won't even see this screen. You can also choose to bypass this whole screen, implement your own pairing service, and if you pass in your own device ID, if you recognize what that device ID is, you can pass that in yourself. And then of course it's pretty standard. You get an on result received, you get say, oh, a success, in which case you then can start subscribing to events. Or in this case, maybe they're missing dependencies, maybe they're missing the radio service, maybe they're missing USB service. So we will give, we've given some methods to help you determine what might be missing for the user and you can pass that information to the user however you'd like. And then of course, once you're done, you just have to subscribe to the data from, you can read it from the device profile. If you'd like the heart rate count, if that's all you need, if you don't need to know the subscription data, if you don't need to know the user's manufacturer ID of that device, then all you need to do is subscribe to the data you need. In this case, heart rate data. We also recommend that you also use the on state device state change to determine what that channel might be doing. So maybe they've temporarily lost the connection, that device will go into searching, maybe the battery ran out, it'll run for searching for a long period. So you should take it, just take a note to keep aware of what happened to that state of that device. And when you're done, we request, it'd be, it, it's easier if you release access once you're done with that service. 
We know when we can start turning off channels in the radio. Once the access has been released, their device profiles like continuous glucose, which require continual access. So we hope users will release access when they need to. And of course, if you'd like to do certain demonstrations such as phone to phone or beta profiles or things that aren't supported in the plugin set, then we also give the full channel interface. This gives you full features like the background scan, so you can receive from many devices, um, shared channels, uh, decimated receive rates, so slaves can actually track master channels at half, quarter, eighth, because it's just the, based on time slots. So what would a general channel flow look like? You would bind the radio service, you would get the channel provider, you would acquire the number of channels you would need, you would configure them, you would then use them, you would interpret them how you'd like, and then you release them and you unbind from the radio service. It's fair, actually fairly, so in this case, you'd come here, you create a, an instant, a reference to a radio service, you create a service connection. You would then acquire a channel, you would get a number of exceptions. We also pass in something called ant network keys. So this is what barricades, say, transmissions from Garmin or Adidas that they don't necessarily want other companies listening to. So we actually distribute network keys to these companies for a fee to make sure they can do proprietary applications without others interfering or listening to it. But in this case, we just define the public network key. And in that case, then, you can configure a channel however you'd like. Channel IDs, proximity thresholds, proximity searches, the R frequency, it's entirely up to you how you'd like to use those channels. And that interface is represented behind a single ant message protocol doc. So the same commands you'd see at an embedded level on a chip or on a multi-mode device or on a cell phone device, it's all common across all platforms. And in which case, in this case, you can just interpret the broadcast data. And then you could also say close that channel after you're done and then all you have to do is release that channel. And that's it. So in a bit of a summary, what could you do with, in this case, simplest, so we've abstracted all those layers for you for using device profiles. You don't need to know channels. You don't need to know how, do you, how this works at a low level are also, it's, fair, it's very, very lightweight. Our protocol consumes maybe 20 kilobytes on, on the SOC, for instance. So we're able to take this program, move it to many, many devices quickly and easily. So we hope that by minimizing the fragmentation, it reduces the work on developers for maintaining their applications. So in this case, I said ant channels are fully individual, and they're all battery powered. So a standard ant channel would look like this, but you could keep adding to that and adding to that because every channel is individual. So now we can just keep expanding the number of channels between each device. So what is very simple from a, from a point to point connection can become much more complex relatively simply using ant channels. So. And channels just form the building blocks of what you can do. And we w are excited to see what developers can do with these channels. As we saw at the hackathon, many people were, didn't quite get to building a mesh or didn't quite get that there wasn't quite enough time. So in that case, we would like to give maybe a little bit more source code and a little bit more push on how you can actually do this kinds of topologies. So that's the, the end of this presentation. And actually, I have a bit of a demo if anyone would like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we want to see the demo. <laughs> Does anyone want to see a demo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And also, these guys have a booth outside. Uh, I'm sure you were going to mention this as well at the end, but go check it out uh, at the booth with them and ask questions and stay in touch. So, this guy is turned off. So, in this case, it's a bit of a small screen. So here I have, oh, this is, okay. So we have a few devices running in an ant chat. 
what they're doing is they're open broadcasting right now so you can actually come here you can select them you can create a chat room and in which case you can see the request on this phone you can see the request on this tablet maybe that doesn't fit very well you can then go <coughs> and join to this room and now you can start saying So now you can actually see that message from here to here to here. And that happens simultaneously between many devices. And this can scale to many, many, many devices. So that's just the quick demo. Of course, as we were saying, we have a booth outside. I, it's a little bit easier for me to show this kind of demo um, face to face. And thank you very much for attending. Cool. <clears throat>